Many people have approached me and they've asked me, you know, what religion are you? Because they see the collar and they first associate with Catholics. And when I tell them I'm Greek Orthodox, the first conception that comes to mind, oh, do you believe in the 12 gods? Like Zeus, Era, or when they hear the word Orthodox, they turn around and associate as a Jewish religion. That, oh, are you Jewish? When we tell people Orthodox Christians, sometimes they'll think of Greek festival or Greek food. That's the only connection they'll make. They really don't know the faith. One time I had um, um, a, a young lady enter the, uh, enter the church that I was, enter here, St. Basil, and uh, I told her we're Orthodox. She says, oh, is that a religion? In the old days, a few years ago, when I used to dress with a black shirt and the, and the tab here, people would be confused. Oh, hi, Father. Oh, tomorrow's Ash Wednesday. And I would say, oh, really? And they'd say, don't you know? I said, no, I'm not Catholic. Well, what are you? I'm Greek Orthodox. Sometimes they know. Most of the times they had no idea. I got frustrated about that, so I wear my robe all the time now. The first time, the first week that I began dressing like that, I went to the store. And the cashier said to me, Oh, hi, Father, I'm Orthodox too. And it made my day. Literally translated, the word Orthodox means uh, correct glory. Uh, many people interpret it as, as the true faith, but it means the correct glory. And the correct glory, glory is something that we give to God. And the Orthodox faith is what we consider the most traditional, the most unadulterated, the closest path to the apostles and to the way uh, Christ taught us to glorify him. The founder of the Orthodox Church simply is our Lord Jesus Christ, who was crucified for the remission of our sins. Our Lord, who we follow, who left us the sacraments to perfect ourselves, to continue to strive to become Christ-like. The significance of this is that from the beginning of our church to today, we continue to follow the same Lord. We are following the same divine liturgy. We are reading the same creed. We are continuing to follow the same traditions of the church. We have not strayed from what Christ originally gave us. birthday of the church is the day of Pentecost. From the time that the Lord was crucified, the disciples seemed to be very frightened. But then the Lord appeared to them several times, and he went with them to Bethany on the feast that we now call the Ascension. And before their eyes, he ascended up into the heavens and disappeared in the clouds. And he blessed them, and he told them to stay together in the holy city, and they would receive power from on high. And he said to them, don't be afraid. I'm not leaving you. I'm going to send you my spirit, which will always be with you, to guide you and to protect you. That's the basis of the sacrament of chrismation, the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit, that gift that Jesus Christ gave to us in his spirit, the spirit of God, which descended on the apostles 10 days after the ascension at the Pentecost when the apostles were locked up afraid of the Jews, afraid of persecution. The apostles were gathered together in the upper room, the same upper room where they had met with the Lord for the Last Supper. And there was suddenly a loud blowing noise and flames of fire appeared over the heads of the apostles, the disciples at the time. Anytime you look at the icon of Pentecost, you see flames sitting on the top of the heads of the apostles. That is the Holy Spirit inspiring them, filling their intellect with the knowledge that they needed to go out and to convert the world. And they were given gifts to speak languages so they would be empowered to spread the word of the gospel. The very same day, people gathered around because they heard the noise going on around this building. Peter went out and began to tell all of these people who had gathered about Jesus. And he spoke in such a powerful way that 3,000 men were baptized Right then, they believed and understood the significance of who Jesus was. Up until then, they were confused, but the disciples were given the clarity of language in order to explain to the people in such a convincing way that they embraced 
the message of the gospel. This is the beginning of the Orthodox Christian faith. After the apostles left that scary closed in room on the day of Pentecost and began to proselytize throughout the world, they began to ordain and to bring in apostles of their own to be able to help spread the message of Christ. Soon after, those apostles ordained other apostles which became bishops and priests and bishops and priests throughout the ages until our ordination. So that if I trace my ordination back through my bishop and his bishop and the bishop that ordained him and the priest that they ordained, the lineage will follow all the way back through the generations, all the way to the twelve apostles themselves in that small back room. Well, the whole point of apostolic succession is, is to not to have the banner of we were here before the rest of you. This just happens to be a historical fact. But the reason behind it is that to sh it shows that there is consistency. Continuity of teachings which comes along with the apostolic succession is very important because it legitimatizes the practices of the church today as being consistent with the practices of the church from the beginning. We have two types of traditions, the capital T and the little t. The capital T is the dogmatical issues of what has been established throughout the years. Baptism, communion, dogmas. At that time, there weren't people, there were scholars to write this stuff down, so it was really orally. It was being done orally. You know, this is how, through viewing, the, the baptisms were taking place. Through viewing, this is the way communion was given because Christ himself established that at the, at the mystical supper and they, the disciples imitated that. They didn't write it down. They saw how it went, they gathered together, and they did it. The oral tradition is as important as any in the early church because there was no way from generation to generation to understand the practices and the realities of the gospel because of the persecution of the Christians. So the oral tradition, the passing on from generation to generation by word of mouth through the practices, the divine liturgy, the, the communion suppers in the homes and in the catacombs at the beginning were extremely important messages that, that went through the generations up until the point where Christianity was free. That is a tradition with a big T. That is a holy tradition. That is something that is uh, paramount to, to what we believe is central to the Orthodox faith. Then there are other traditions that we say traditions with a little T that are not as essential. The Orth Greek Orthodox have the red eggs for Easter. That is a little tradition. Red Easter egg symbolizing the blood that Christ shed and symbolizing the egg which was, you know, uh, which opens and cracks like the tomb opened and out comes life, out comes Jesus Christ. Roasting the lamb. <laughs> which has a symbolism in the faith. The Russian Orthodox bring food and bread and cheeses and meats to the front of the altar and place it on Easter midnight service to be prayed over. The praying over of grapes during metamorphosis, which is the 6th of August, as thanking God for the harvest. Those are all beautiful practices that make our faith fuller, but art is, art is as important as the holy traditions. There's a great deal of importance placed on the Bible uh, because Christ's teachings come from the, the New Testament. The New Testament is a fulfillment of the Old Testament because many of the Old Testament writers preached or prophesied about Christ and the New Testament is that fulfillment. Oftentimes I hear people say, well, I just need the Bible. This phrase alone is nothing new to the church. It's nothing new. Martin Luther said it in using the Latin sola scriptura, only the scripture. Well, at the time of the apostles, at the time of Jesus, was there a scripture? What do we know about scripture? It came out of the tradition of the church. Because now the Bible, it wasn't put together in one day or one week, or it wasn't like a novel that somebody wrote. The Bible was put together over a span of, well, the the New Testament was put together over a span of 30, 40 years. The formation of the New Testament canon verifies in many ways how the Holy Spirit guides the church. The fathers of the church at that time in the fourth century came together and screened all of the writings that were floating around because we didn't have any computers or fax machines or photocopiers. 
everything had been written out by hand. And there were some things that were legitimate and some things that were not legitimate. And the fathers, having the conviction of the guidance of the Holy Spirit, screened all of these writings and said, yes, this is correct, this is authentic, this is not good. And they put together what we call the New Testament. When people hear the word ecumenical councils, they think, oh, here comes some dry theology. You know, what is ecumenical? Well, ecumenical means the houses. So all the houses, all the, the dioceses of the area would meet. And the councils specifically were designed to set a limit on the variety of Christian teachings that were propping up. Beginning in the fourth century, there were seven great ecumenical councils through the history of the church. What these were were meetings of all of the bishops of the world were invited to come together and to discuss the important issues of the church. Every area of the known world at that time that had churches, Christian churches, had representatives there. And they discussed and they debated issues of faith. If we did not have these assemblies of bishops and fathers to convene these councils, we would not have the divine scriptures. We would not have the very creed we read in our divine liturgy as a unified body. We would not have the depictions of the icons that we see. When the councils were formed and they would make their decisions, they would say, it seems right to the Holy Spirit and to us. And then they would spell out what they understood. And then that would be verified by a later on council. So that it was an ongoing process. There was never one person or one council that spoke out and said, this is it, this is the teaching of the church. And what happened was, an issue of faith could not become doctrine or practice in the faith unless there was a unanimous decision. It had to be unanimous. Another very interesting thing about the ecumenical councils is that it took the next council, which usually skipped two generations, to make sure that all of those bishops and leaders were dead. Maybe they were going in the wrong direction. But it took another council to codify what they had done to make it doctrine of the church, to make it part of the dogma of the church, to make sure it was a check and balance of faith. The seven great sacraments which lead to our salvation are baptism, chrismation, the Holy Eucharist, the Holy Priesthood, marriage, the Sacrament of Reconciliation, Repentance, Confession, and then Holy, the Evangelion, or as unction as it is more commonly known as. As to why they're called sacraments is because they are sacred. And what do we mean by they're sacred? I mean they're set apart from what you do every day in your world, in your life. These are spiritual vehicles designed to have a Christian participate in the life of the church in a full and meaningful way. The Orthodox faith is trying to get you to do in their infinite wisdom is getting you to do what Jesus did. After all, it was Christ who fasted, who, bat who was baptized, who spoke about confession and so forth. If it was good enough for Christ, it's got to be good enough for us because Christ gives us all the keys to the kingdom. This is a way for us to get there. We can't save ourselves. We need God's help, and God offers us his help in the Holy Sacraments. The sacraments are the expressions of God's grace, God's power that comes to us. Jesus himself instituted some of the sacraments in a very, very clear way. Certainly, he was baptized, and it was made clear to us that we should follow his example and be baptized. He established confession after he returned from the dead and he told his disciples whosoever sins you forgive are forgiven whosoever sins you retain are retained he gave them the power the fundamentals of holy confession the last supper is obvious the mystical last supper when he told the disciples this is my body this is my blood not it represents or symbolizes it is so we have the sacraments which are given to us in a material form but are filled with the saving grace of God for our sanctification and our transformation. A lot of times we hear a lot of other faiths that turn around and say, well, you know what, I don't deal 
with anything, whatever. I go directly to the source. I go directly to God, and I talk to God directly. Don't need the icons, don't need anything. And I always, always ask the question to them, why do you have pictures in your house? Because, well, it reminds me of people that I may have known in my life or people maybe that I've never knew in my life, whether it was our great-great-grandparents, people that may have touched my life, affected me, or people that, events that were really uplifting and enjoyable. And I said, you explain exactly what an icon really is then. Because in your house, you have these pictures, and the church has the same issue of pictures in its, in its house, in God's house, telling us of events of people that we did not see or know, because they are part of our entire family throughout the years. Icons are the theology in color. Uh, of course, we have intellectual capability in this day and age, bar none, especially with the Internet. But in the early church, they had nothing. They didn't have intellectual capability of reading or writing or codifying. They had to talk in parables, like Christ did, in sermons, which people could listen to, and in icons, which people could learn. They were didactic. They were teachers. They were teachers not only to the soul, but also to the mind of what went on in the life of Christ. So therefore, they become great opportunities to teach people of who Jesus was and what was the history behind the event of Pentecost or the freeing of Christianity by Constantine the Great. Who was Constantine? Who was Helen? Who was Basil? Who was Nectarios in this day and age? It continues within the history of the church. Theology in color. Didactic, spiritual, mirrors of the soul, allowing our eyes to become the windows of the soul, bringing heaven into us through color, through art. The Virgin Mary is viewed as the greatest woman, the icon of all women, that how she, women should live their lives. The Virgin Mary is not worship. She's venerated. Uh, we only worship God. We pray to the Virgin Mary to help us uh, so she could... Uh, go to her son and plead our case to her son for us. She is the go-between between, between uh, our prayers uh, through Jesus um, via the, the Virgin Mary. Well, being born again, that's what all of us Orthodox Christians who are baptized, we are born again. We are born again in the baptismal font. The Father of the Church calls the baptismal font both a tomb and a womb. And it is a womb because it gives us our, it gives us our second birth that Christ talks about in the Gospels. And it's a tomb because St. Paul makes the analogy that in the waters of baptism, um, we, when we descend into the waters of baptism, our old our old man, our old self, our, our broken body dies and we, when we arise from the um, baptismal waters, we are resurrected with a new body. However, it takes work to remain there. It's not, baptism is not an automatic formula for salvation because you can fall after the grace of baptism and mar your baptismal seal. That's why Christ himself instituted the sacrament of repentance and of reconciliation to bring you back into the fold. So it's work for everybody. The rebirth is not something that just happens once and we go on our merry way and say, hey, I'm saved, whatever. But reborn in Christ really is a constant lifestyle throughout, throughout our lives. It's never ending from the moment we take our first breath until the day we take our last breath. Oftentimes I'm, I get asked, are we saved by grace or by acts or by faith? And the somewhat simple answer to this, if we read the epistle of St. James, is that faith without works is dead. The Bible is very clear that we are saved by faith. If we have faith, then we're going to do good works. If we don't do good works, it means that we don't have faith. But we should take it perhaps to a different level. We're saved by the grace of God. Some of us think that we work and somehow we earn our salvation. We can never earn salvation. Sometimes we make this all, this process of salvation, 
too difficult. Someone is trying to fast, and they broke the fast, and they get all worried and they say, "Oh, I owe so many days. I owe so many meals. I fell behind." God is not counting those things. That's not important to Him. The importance is that we're continuously in the process of trying. Once we make the commitment to live the Christian life, it is an ongoing commitment. We can never stop. In the Orthodox faith, those who have not become、uh, baptized, chrismated Orthodox, are not allowed to receive communion yet. But they are allowed to experience the worship services and start developing an understanding, so that they may become chrismated and experience. And people could ask, "Can join any church I want to?" You know, all I do is proclaim, proclaim that I'm saved, and I can go down to the Protestant church or down to any other church and give my dues and everything else and and be done with. Why is it such a process to? Embrace orthodoxy because it is a rich faith. The Orthodox Church never had altar calls, where it happens quick, with a quick fix, with a bumper sticker phrase, with something immediate and gratifying right there and then to your emotions. It goes beyond that and deeper than that. The truth is, is I take this very seriously, in the reality of bringing someone into the faith, because we are accountable for this person's soul. If you look at the priest's stole that wears he wears over his neck is petrahili, the bottom of the、um, stole are these little tassels that hang, and that represents the souls that hang on his responsibility. So, people's souls are in the priest's hands. Oftentimes, people perceive、uh, once they start to hear about Orthodox Christianity as an ancient ritualistic、uh, faith, whereas anything that has sprouted up here in the United States is seen as new and innovative. Many other faiths are popular simply because they offer possibly a quick fix or a quick road to salvation, and a road that is not that difficult. The Orthodox Church would be the road less traveled. Well, if we look at the pattern of these NRMs, these new religious movements, how long have they been around? I mean, just look in the last 100 years, the, ninth, the, the 20th century. Where are they? How did they evolve? How many of them are, are, are gone? Where will they be 200 years from now? 3,000 years from now? Two weeks from now? When you walk into a church, you smell incense. You see the icons. You are filled with the power of God and the grace of God within the tradition of the church. Many of the other Christian denominations cut those aspects out, thinking that going direct to the source, being thinkers of the Western world, especially going straight to the source, only to Scripture. But how will we know about Scripture? How how will we teach Scripture if we don't use the fullness of the faith within the tradition of the Church? Those are all aids to get to the message.、Uh, Protestantism, for an example, has cut most of that out, trying to go right to the source, but yet not giving the people the examples of how the source is to be lived, and thus cutting so much of the richness of the faith through, especially through the saints of the Church. And through the traditions of the church, out of the life of people who just may be converted because of it, who just may be saved because of it, because of one saint, one holy tradition, one practice that clicks in their lives and that directs them back to the road that which Christ wants them to walk. Evangelical means the 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 the, pre, the, the correct preaching of the gospel. The, the, the promulgation of the gospel, the evangelion, the good news. Our church is, is very evangelical. In fact, it was evangelical because in 33, 33 A.D., when Christ, when the church began, our mission was to was to preach. If you'll remember at Pentecost, people spoke in different languages. Why did they speak in different languages? To preach the gospel in different languages. Okay, why would you speak in one language and people don't understand? Okay. The mission of the church is to go out and evangelize and speak to people that un don't understand your language. If we're just speaking Greek or Italian or any, if we're just speaking a certain language just to hear ourselves speak it, what good is it? We're not missioning to people. We're not telling the message of Christ to people. We're just hearing ourselves speak because we love the language. Would Christ have done that? Of course not. He spoke in the language of the people. 
it's very simple to understand the position of the Orthodox Church in today's world. Uh, it's really a transitional period because we are coming of age. It will take a few generations to get where we should be because of the great persecutions that we have suffered. Uh, the Greek Orthodox Church suffered the persecution under the Turks for 400 years. There was the great fear that their identity, their religion, their culture was all going to be wiped out, and that's what it was working towards to. And so they held on to that faith, that religion, their identity so strong, so fiercely, that that's what kept them alive and kept their identity alive and their faith alive all through that occupation. Maybe we are guilty of, uh, of keeping the church to ourselves, of not letting any strangers in. But we've seen the beauty of converts coming in. And when we see the fact that converts embrace not only the Orthodox faith, but they embrace our Greek tradition, then it's much easier for us to open our doors. Because I think we were afraid that people were going to come to the Orthodox Church and take away our ethnicity. I'm torn between the two. That is my problem. I'm torn between the two because my parents did come from Greece. I grew up in the Greek Orthodox faith and I speak the language and I love the hymnography and chanting the Greek. But I also have to turn and look at my children. What I really want to know is how am I going to be explaining or how is the priest going to be explaining to this generation coming up what Christ is, what the Orthodox Church is talking about, what that, you know, the, 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 the essence of salvation is if you talk to them only in a foreign language, in which a language they do not understand. I sympathize on the other part because my mother loves the Greek language, and my father does too. So there has to be some kind of a balance. We have to balance it out. I think the, fut the future of the Orthodox Church is in those converting to the faith. More and more Orthodox churches are using the English, predominantly using the English language in the divine services to accommodate and to welcome all those who don't understand the Greek language. Many of the Greek traditions and Byzantine rites must be preserved in our tradition of the divine services, but the language of the services are more and more being translated into English so our people are able to understand. Actually, I think it's changing because um, in the evolution of converts coming to the Orthodox Church and actually, if I could say, energizing the evangelical spirit that the Orthodox Church once had and should have, which never should have left, I think the converts are bringing that zeal back into the church. and. Uh, uh, and we are seeing the errors of our ways because our church now is kind of like hidden. So we're just, it's, it's a matter of rethinking of where we're at and what exactly the mission of the church is. Is it to keep ourselves closed as a Greek community or is it to mission throughout the entire world?